Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session DA307. My name is Masood, Cloud Solution Architect at Google, and I have joined here with Abdul, Lead Architect, Cybersecurity Analytics at TELUS. We'd like to talk to you about how we have built a network anomaly detection solution to find outliers in NetFlow log. We'll focus on four key areas. First, how we have simulated production like volume in a pop sub topic. Secondly, a data flow anomaly detection pipeline to aggregate data and extract features in a fixed window. Thirdly, create a k-means clustering model using BigQuery ML for train and normalize data. But before we get into details, I'd like to hand it over to Abdul, who is gonna give us a little bit of context about the problem we are trying to solve and details about TELUS. Over to you, Abdul. Thank you, Masood. Hi, everyone. My name is Abdul Rahman Sattar, and I'm the lead architect for cybersecurity analytics at TELUS. I would also like to acknowledge over here the support of Janahan Skandarinyam, who is responsible for cybersecurity analytics at TELUS and is the creator and driver of the initiatives at TELUS associated with this presentation, and Raghulan Sinaraja, who is responsible for cybersecurity DevOps at TELUS. So a little about TELUS. We are Canada's fastest growing national telecommunications company with over 13.4 million customer connections across our networks. We are a leader in technology, culture, and sustainability. And we are committed uh, to giving where we live. And we are the first Canadian company recognized as the world's outstanding philanthropic company. Cybersecurity at TELUS is led by a talented 400 strong team protecting both TELUS and our security customers. Innovation is a key value in our team and we strive to push the boundaries at the cutting edge of technology. So of late, the idea of using big data analytics for cybersecurity use cases has become prevalent across numerous industries. Areas such as smart grids and scatter systems, autonomous connected vehicles, security operation centers, healthcare systems can benefit from this intersection of big data analytics and cybersecurity. The pinnacle of collaboration would be prevention of damage caused by malicious cybersecurity activity due to an exceptionally accurate prediction of such activity before it even occurs. The gold or oil that runs the engine of big data analytics anywhere in any industry is data. No matter how good your advanced analytics algorithms are, unless they've been enriched with vast amount of data, the, the, the results they provide will not be up to par. And this is where TELUS, like other organizations who have access to unique data has a key advantage. We carry the bulk of the nation's communication data across our, uh, across our, uh, across our pipelines. We have a continuous stream of both labeled and unlabeled data from very diverse data sources, enabling the application of state-of-the-art advanced analytics techniques to detect malicious communications. Anomalous communication detection can be used as a first step for malicious communication detection. And this presentation goes through that first step and shows how we can use Google's tech stack to power anomaly detection. So now uh, I'd start zooming in on the architecture of anomaly detection engine that we've deployed on premise on TELUS. So anomaly detection is one of the several analytics use cases running on a shared multi-tenant Hadoop 2 data lake at TELUS. The end goal of anomaly detection is twofold. One, to build baseline models for subscriber communication. And second, to use those baseline models to identify anomalous subscriber communication and uh, publish them downstream during the inferencing stage. And then downstream, we have multiple analytics components running that pick up that pick up these anomalous uh, anomalous points identified by the anomaly detection engine and correlate with, correlate them with other uh, alerts that we got uh, about the subscriber to uh, identify malicious uh, user behavior. So the tech stack uh, the, the, on on the on the left of the slide, you see the tech stack that we've deployed that we've deployed the the anomaly detection engine on. So we've divided the tech stack into three uh, into three swim lanes. So at the bottom you see that we have Yarn and HDFS deployed on physical nodes. So we use Yarn for resource orchestration and resource uh, management. We also use Yarn, uh, uh, Yarn resource queues for uh, uh, resource quota uh, amongst uh, various uh, cluster tenants. We use HDFS for uh, reliable and distributed storage. 
And then in the middle swim lane, you see that we've deployed Spark and multiple uh, libraries of Spark, Spark Core, Spark ML, Spark Streaming. And we use Spark for distributed compute, uh, for its ability to uh, do compute in a distributed fashion and for stream processing and batch processing uh, workloads at scale. We also leverage uh, Spark ML quite a bit to do machine learning at scale, both for training models and for inferencing. And then on top, you see uh, in the top lane, in the top swim lane, you see that we have uh, various uh, Spark applications running for anomaly detection engine on our cluster. We also use Splunk for visualization and dashboards. And uh, with Splunk query language, we, uh, we give uh, external teams ability to do ad hoc queries on the data, both raw data and, and, and detections that reside on our data lake. So in this slide, uh, you see an end-to-end -end, uh, architecture, pipeline architecture for the anomaly detection engine that we have at TELUS. So the architectural, the, 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 the architecture, architectural diagram is divided into three swim lanes. We have ingest at the left, then we have processing swim lane in which we have multiple Spark applications running, and then we have storage where we use HDFS. So what's happening over here is that the, 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 the subscriber flow logs is wrapped up in syslog stream and it's being streamed uh, to, uh, the, to, to, the, to the Hadoop cluster. From there on in the Hadoop cluster, we have feature extraction engine which picks up this, uh, which uses Spark uh, streaming to pick up this data stream. It uses a fixed size window of five minutes uh, to, do, to create many batches. And then it does additional processing on those many batches. It does, uh, it does feature extraction, it does feature enrichment, and then it does aggregation. And that processed batch is then written to HDFS for storage. And you can see that in number two, in label number two. And then what's happening downstream is that the modeling engine essentially picks up that processed batch, and you can see that in number three, and it applies k-means clustering on it. It uh, does distributed k-means clustering uh, for and, and build clusters for user behavior, for user uh, behavior, uh, communication behavior. And it extracts uh, other metadata about those clusters as well. It uses uh, uh, cluster mean, cluster variance, cluster density, and all of that metadata, plus the clusters that we have identified in this stage are written to HDFS for storage. Then downstream, uh, what happens uh, is that you see in the anomaly detection engine, uh, we fetch that those clusters that were identified, that were built by the modeling engine and, and also the batches that were processed uh, by the feature extraction engine where features were extracted, uh, all like the, those batches and the models are fetched by the anomaly detection engine and the anomaly detection engine applies uh, models uh, to those processed batches to identify anomalous uh, communication behavior. And the way it, it identifies anomalous communication behavior is by taking into account all the metadata that we extracted uh, about the cluster. We use cluster centroid, we use cluster mean, cluster variance, uh, cluster density, and, and the anomalies are a function, all of, all, uh, is a function of all these parameters. And once the anomalies are identified, they are stored to HDFS and are also published downstream, where, as I said before, the downstream uh, analytics components use those anomalies identified and correlate them with other alerts uh, for the subscriber uh, to identify malicious user behavior. So why did we, uh, what propelled us to use GCP? So we are a small team and what we, what we, find, what we find is that our time like, not only goes into analytics, into developing cybersecurity analytics, but quite a, quite a bit of time is also spent on infrastructure troubleshooting, infrastructure management. And that's where we want to leverage GCP, GCP's serverless uh, architecture capabilities so that we can be hands-free from the infrastructure uh, management and infrastructure troubleshooting issues. With uh, state-of-the-art services that GCP provides, like uh, uh, Dataflow and Google BigQuery, both of them are serverless, uh, serverless services, uh, we, 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 we want to focus on our core value prop, which is cybersecurity analytics. Additionally, uh, Google BigQuery is is a state of the art is is a state of the art query engine. It can it it's blazingly fast on large amounts of data, and it 
it brings a lot of uh, machine learning capabilities out of the box. So we want to tap into BigQuery uh, to create uh, models for us, like to do faster iteration on model building. And that allows us to move at a fast speed. Additionally, uh, Google BigQuery actually has a dead simple uh, SQL interface, which uh, a lot of data scientists are familiar with, and that simplifies our code quite a bit. And and again, like allows us to do model uh, to do model building at at a at a very fast pace. And it and and the code and the code that we have because it's SQL code is easy to maintain as well. And it removes like all the complexity that we have as a result of Spark ML. And then uh, Google, by having uh, Google's, uh, by having uh, our data in Google BigQuery, it enables AutoML. So AutoML essentially allows you to build baseline models very quick. And that feature allows us to test our own machine learning models and benchmark our own machine, like the performance of our own machine learning models. So, and, 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 and the elastic architecture uh, capabilities in Google in GCP uh, allows us to have uh, streamlined resource usage and have a better cost model for our pipeline. So essentially, uh, this is the architecture that we landed uh, in, GC in, in our GCP pilot. Essentially, like when you look at it, it's, it's very similar to the architecture that we had on-prem for our anomaly detection engine pipeline. There are still three swim lanes, like it's ingest, it's process, and like the ingest swim lane, the process swim lane, and the store swim lane. But what we have done over here is that instead of using Hadoop, uh, Hadoop tools and frameworks, uh, we've re like, like, like Spark and, and, and Spark ML and HDFS, We've we've gone like entirely Google native. We've you like we're using uh, Dataflow and Beam. So Beam is a vendor uh, vendor agnostic framework. We're using Dataflow, which is which is serverless. We're using PubSub. We're using cloud storage. We're using BigQuery. BigQuery essentially is acting as a data warehouse for us and 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 uh, allows us to search like raw data at really fast speed. Also, BigQuery provides us machine learning capabilities, as I mentioned, and it allows us for faster model building and simplifies our machine learning code. Uh, so with that, I'd actually pass on to Masood who can discuss the intricacies of this architecture. All right, thanks, Abdul. Okay, so if you look at this end-to-end -end architectures, let's dig a little bit more. Um, so first thing is your ingest and trigger. So if you look at the overall ingest architectures, we have two different sources of data that we are dealing with. One is cloud storage and the other one is PubSub. Now, for production settings, you have to, you know, somehow need to pass those data to the storage and the pops up topic, either through a FluentD plugin or, you know, through a Kafka Connect. Now, what we did for our POC, because we could not uh, get access to all the production data because of the sensitive information, uh, we created a tool uh, using open source uh, Java Beam, uh, which we could simulate to create 250,000 messages per second in a pops up topic. Right, and we're going to get into a little bit more on details on that. But assume now that we have all the data in a pub sub topic, the second step would be to process. And we have built a uh, data flow pipeline that uh, aggregate those data in a fixed window, um, and then uh, do a batch insert for a partition table in BigQuery. Uh, if there is any outliers found, we also stream those data to a different table on BigQuery so that further analysis can be done. Now, a lot of those logics and you know everything that's happened within that process, uh, we uh, we pretty much rebuilt it from scratch. Uh, if you remember when Abdul mentioned about the Spark, now this is actually built on Apache Beam uh, Java SDK uh, with the serverless architecture on Dataflow Runner. Now, the third thing was so now the data we have it on BigQuery. What we wanted to do is uh, to be able to see uh, how easily we could train them. And using a BigQuery ML came in class train model, we could easily train them, um, you know, uh, and also to normalize. Uh, in terms of how to, you know, make sure that it's used in a production environment, uh, what we did is we put all the SQL like statement for uh, for for BQ, BQML um, in a store procedure. And you know, when you have used it within schedule query within BigQuery, now you could literally, uh, you know, retrain the data in either ad hoc or also you know, whenever you wanted to use it, uh, let's say every any scheduled manner. Now, in addition to this, uh, you also see the cloud DLP. Uh, as I said, there may, there may be some sensitive information on the log. So we also try to use cloud DLP for, uh, for the detection. 
uh, for any sensitive information like MSI number or subscriber ID. Uh, we automated the whole process using Cloud Deal for CICD purposes. Now, for the next few slides, what we wanted to go through is some of the challenges we had to building this architecture. So let's take them. So as I said, we needed to find a tool that we could use to leverage uh, for simulation and production data load. Now, if you look at what's inside this data flow pipeline, it actually uses a open source JSON library. Uh, on right hand side, you could see a JSON schema that I have. And if you look at the schema that we have, it's very similar to the NetFlow log schema. So for example, you have fields like subscriber ID, source IP, destination IP, and for each one of those attributes is associated with the function. Uh, so for example, source IP has IPv4. Uh, what that would do is uh, it would generate a random IPv4 address for source IP. Now, if you look at a um, lot of those fields, uh, like a long and integers, you could also set up the range for those port and uh, you know, the different attributes that we have. Now, the challenge was when you use that, uh, you know, when you use that library within a data flow pipeline, uh, we just need to be make sure that we have put enough workers uh, so that we could reach to our target uh, message per second goal. So for our case, what we noticed was, um, you know, it was around 3000 messages per second per core. Um, so we added around 30 and one standard for workers and we could easily reach out to that, uh, that production volume. Um, there's another challenge that I just quickly wanted to mention. You know, if you look at the schema, it's very random, right? but we cannot be completely random. So for example, field like destination IP, uh, we needed to make sure that because you're gonna do a group by on destination IP, so it's somehow, you know, we limit the number of IPs that, uh, you know, we're gonna test it on. Uh, so this tool allows us to be very flexible and create function like subnet, or also if you think about, you know, end time has to be after start time. So those kind of, uh, you know, features we could easily build in so that our data is very production-like. So now that we have all the information or all the data published on a, uh, you know, the pop up topic, uh, this is where all the fun starts. We, we have built a, um, you know, a, I would say a pretty complex data flow pipeline, pretty much simulated whatever uh, the logic that we have on on-prem uh, within a week. Now, one of the challenges we had to face um, is how, uh, you know, how scalable this would be and how fast we could actually aggregate those data. So if you look at our, uh, you know, the production volume, we're looking at around 20 terabyte of data, uh, which is you know, 250,000 messages per second translated to 20 terabyte of data every day. And if you have a 10 minutes window, you're looking at 150 gigabyte of data accumulated within that period. And we are aggregating those data within so that it's, you know, it doesn't have a system lag in it. Um, so the way we did this is, um, and it's a very simple process uh, by using, uh, you know, Java Beam uh, inbuilt transform called JSON to row. So think about as we are getting all the JSON, uh, JSON rows, uh, we convert them is using inbuilt function called JSON to row. Um, and which is really good because now that we have row object or row type, uh, what you can do on row is every row is associated with the schema and you could group by uh, to the field name or the column name very easily and also add a aggregated function to it. So for our use case, it was more, uh, so you're gonna group by subscriber ID and you're gonna group by, um, you know, the destination subnet, and then you apply aggregate function like mean, max, average. So if you look at the number of features that we have, it's pretty much we're aggregating data in that window and we're trying to find out what is the mean, max, average for transmission receiving byte, uh, what was the duration, what is probably the approximate count for number of IPs within that time frame? Um, so if you look at on the screenshot we have, you know, you're looking at estimated size around 11 gigabyte within a very small window. And after aggregation, you could see that it come down to uh, close to only one gigabyte. So the key thing was that, hey, it was really scalable and it was really easy to uh, build, um, you know, such a pipeline without, you know, just using the inbuilt transform and, you know, let the data flow uh, handling all the scaling issues for us. So let's go to the next one. So now that we have data on, uh, you know, we have, uh, so we are using a partition table because it's a, you know, 20 terabyte data accumulation every day. And the reason we're using uh, dead partition because we don't, you know, when you retrain those, use those features to retrain, we don't want to go um, like all the historical data. We probably only care about the last few days. And that's why we, we are using the date partition. And 
it was super simple for us to do, you know, just to use the SQL statement. Uh, you could just create a k-means clustering now that you have, you have your data on a partition table. And, you know, within 15 minutes, we actually uh, uh, trained uh, close to terabyte scale data, and it's completely segmented with different cluster. Um, and it also allows us to evaluate. So for example, we wanted to try out, try it out with different number of cluster, what the DB index looks like, and we found our sweet spot was number of cluster when, it, when it's used with uh, four. So now the data is segmented, we're actually not done yet. Uh, we had to do a little bit of normalization, right? Now, the way we did normalization, so now think about all the, uh, you know, the central cluster we have, and we went through each cluster and find all those points and using standard deviation function, we just created a normalized distance. Now that is the normalized distance that we're gonna use later for uh, you know, outline prediction, online prediction. Now, another challenge for this one was, um, you know, how soon you're gonna retrain, right? Um, so we're using a scheduled query um, uh, along with the stored procedure, multi-statement SQL support. We just saved the query and rerun when you when wanted it to be. Uh, and we could also do the version control so that, you know, if you wanted to change some schema or change some, uh, you know, the features, we could easily do that as well. Um, so let's go to the next one. So now that we have our normalized data, what we did is, um, so for BigQuery ML, one of the things that you have to know that you could actually import it as a TensorFlow model, right? And you could import it on a GCS bucket. Um, we use a very similar approach. Um, you know, what we did is we directly query our normalized table uh, from data flow when it starts up and use it as a side input. So now that we have those normalized information available and side input only operates within those, you know, the 10 minutes or five minutes window ag aggregation window that we have. So it's gonna be refreshed automatically um, as our pipeline process data. So if you recreated a model, you have a new normalized, normalized factors, it's, you know, data flow pipeline should be able to see it without actually doing any downtime or, uh, or, or restart. Now, how we are actually doing the outlier detection, and it's a two-step process. Um, we used Apache Commons math functions, just you know, some distance uh, calculating distance function that we could easily leverage. So the step one was we needed to find out, you know, now that we are getting our all the input vectors data. Um, so step one was to find out who is the closest centroid, right? Which is the closest centroid for this input vector? Once we know that centroid information based on the normalized distance that we have calculated earlier. We, we put it together, we put them in a, uh, you know, a standard scoring system. And if it's a three standard deviation above mean or two standard deviation above mean, we know that that could be a good candidate for outlier. So if you look at the, you know, the diagram I have on the right hand side, um, so we have three different clusters showing and you could see that there's one point uh, which is way further than our center point or the, you know, the standard deviation uh, distance, but there's also a normal point which is within the boundary. Right, so that's how we know if it's an outlier or not. Uh, now, finding a single outlier may not be enough. We are trying to look for a pattern of outliers to be able to see that, hey, there may be something going on in terms of security. Now, the another screenshot that I have right now, so you could see that, you know, for the feature extraction, it's really great. Um, so we extracted the features and we're doing, the, uh, going through the DLP transform, and then we put it a batch insert to our partition table but with the same feature extract also branched out uh, to our anomaly detection uh, transform, which is getting all the normalized data as a side input. And then uh, you know, within the anomaly detection, we're doing those two operations that I just mentioned. Uh, and then we stream those data, if found, we stream those data to, uh, to outlier table, hoping that, hey, someone's gonna start looking at them and to find the, hey, if it's really a risk or not. Okay, so in summary, you can see, we have built an end-to-end -end serverless anomaly detection solution is less than a four weeks. That successfully processed 250,000 events per second using Dataflow, which comes down to around 20 terabyte of data, uh, daily accumulation of data. We have trained and evaluated a terabyte scales data by, by, by using BigQuery ML in less than 15 minutes and found outliers in near real time. If you're more interested to learn about this solution, please check out the GitHub link in here. Hopefully you find this talk useful and thanks for listening in.